Hi, I'm Pam Jocelyn, and I'm an Albert Einstein Fellow um, with the Naval STEM Coordination Office. And today, I would like to welcome Matt Stone. So, hi, Matt. How are you today? Hey, good morning. Great. This afternoon, this morning. This afternoon. <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Matt Stone, uh, I am a mechanical engineer uh, here in the Human Systems Engineering Department. Uh, so, that's within NOC AD. And uh, I'm actually, uh, I come from Missouri. I um, actually went to school out in Missouri, and uh, I guess I had an internship out here, and that's kind of what got my foot in the door uh, to uh, my pathway towards uh, naval aviation. That's awesome. So what did you, what did you major in? So I uh, double majored as an undergraduate, uh, undergraduate. I did aerospace and mechanical engineering. Um, and I finished in uh, December of 2014. Uh, wrapped up both degrees, and I was here full time the next June, June 2015, and um, been here ever since. Awesome. So, what do you do now? So uh, now I actually, I, I, like I said, I pinballed around a little bit. I now uh, I find myself in the uh, the manned aviation human computer interaction HCI lab. Uh, or the, the branch, and so within that we have the Human Computer Interaction Lab, the HSIL. And uh, it is uh, really focused on how does the human operator interact with the computer system, uh, whether it be through you know, computer screen interfaces, digital interaction, uh, or uh, even you know, stepping back from, from electronics, you know, cockpit placement, for example, uh, uh, layouts of various switches and all of that kind of stuff. That all falls under the you know kind of the human computer interaction scope. Um, so that's where that's where I find myself today. How's that like relate to real world, or would I see that elsewhere? Yeah. So, um, and <laughs> this is almost a sometimes tends to be the bane of our existence uh, in human systems is that the the human systems aspect of the system is tends to be one of the last things that's thought about, and so it tends to be the thing that gets you know, funded last, or it's the thing that has to get fixed later on down the road when people, you know, users, it gets to users and users discover that it's kind of hard to use it, you know, no matter how great it is. And so um, uh, we tend to be an area that, you know, touches every aspect, I mean, anything that the human operator might interact with. So we're talking in the cockpit, for example, um, you know, all the buttons and switches and the computer screen layouts and all, excuse me, all of that stuff. But also in the back seat, maybe uh, uh, stuff that the air crew in the back might be operating with. Um, on the ground, you know, this also gets into, for example, maintenance world, right? Mm -hmm. Anything that a maintainer might have to interact with buttons and switches and knobs and things to perform their activities. Uh, so human systems department really kind of has, has a pretty far reaching um, uh, contact, you know, throughout, throughout the fleet. So you're talking a little bit about what you do, and how does that relate to the Navy? So uh, the Navy, you know, it inherently, and maybe in the future this will change, right? We can speculate, but right now today, human operators um, are integral, right? In the design, operation, fielding, um, end of life, every aspect of, uh, of naval air systems. So it's it's in the Navy's best interest to have a, a human systems expertise uh, in all aspects. This is more broad than just the human computer interaction aspect, right? That's just one small piece of, of the department. Um, but again, it comes back to uh, because inevitably, even you know, if you want to think about like in an unmanned system, for example, there are still humans involved. They're not on the aircraft, but there are still humans involved, whether they are operators on the ground uh, or it's a, you know, maybe it's a drone, in which case you still have maintenance activities. And there's, there, are, there will always be human activity in some respect. Uh, and so because of that, we, we as the Navy have to design uh, to those operators in mind. Okay. So now you do work with some augmented reality. What does yes. that look like? Yeah, well, uh, actually, I'll, and I'll give you a, I'll give you the 30 second, I guess, background of how it came to be. So uh, I actually went back to grad school in uh, 2017, uh, funded through NICE, uh, Naval Innovative Science and Engineering, 
Um, but it was a full-time on-campus degree up at College Park. I did a master's in aerospace. And my thesis work was in augmented reality. Specifically, it was in how, do you, how could you, can you potentially use augmented reality to improve an operator's perf uh, performance? Uh, so we had a, a task laid out where we had, I had participants came in and they you know, would perform activities and I would measure how long does it take them to do it? Uh, how many mistakes do they make? That kinds of stuff. And can you, I guess the hypothesis is, can you improve that performance through the use of you know, an augmented reality symbology, for example? So that was kind of the seed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as I finished up my thesis work, uh, actually I turned around, it came, came to a head one day, and I turned around to the department and I asked, you know, leadership, where should we house this work? Right, mm -hmm. because it's important. Yeah. And this new technology is going to continue to develop, which of course we've, we've all now seen over the last you know, five years. Uh, who is going to house, who in the department is going to house the expertise for this and be the subject matter expert? And they said, you. <laughs> so, uh, I, that was, I guess, formally, that was when I switched uh, to a, I, I moved to a different branch. So that was where I moved to the, uh, the human computer interaction uh, lab and stood up a team within it. So now uh, within that lab, we have the human systems engineering extended reality research team, which is a long name, HSEER is the acronym. And that was in, that was in spring of 2020. And since then, so it's been about three years now, three and a half years. and. We have, we've built up a bit of a portfolio uh, to date, and we, we've had uh, numerous collaborative efforts uh, with uh, partner labs uh, really across the NOC. So uh, we've partnered with uh, folks up in Lakehurst. Um, we, we've done a number of collaborative efforts with uh, Naval Postgraduate School uh, and the Moves Institute out in California. And uh, all of these efforts are towards you know, developing and refining and learning where can we apply Augmented reality, that's one piece. There's augmented virtual reality. Uh, all of it together, the umbrella term is called extended reality. So where can we apply extended reality uh, to improve human performance, improve mission success, et cetera? To help some of our, our students watching, could you define like what augmented reality Absolutely. and virtual reality? Yeah, um, and I'm so glad you asked that because I actually had, I had to find the definition for myself when I got into this because I had no background in this whatsoever. I did not learn anything about augmented virtual reality in school. Uh, and so what I came across, my thesis work, there is a, what is now commonly accepted uh, as, I, I don't hold me to it, I don't remember the name of the diagram, but there is a, uh, there is a scale that was published in, I want to say the early 90s, uh, that's called the, the augmented, let's see, augmented virtuality continuum line, it's a scale. And on one end, you have, on the one extreme end, typically uh, rep, uh, represented on the left side of the scale, you have real reality. There's no digital, there's no nothing, right? This is what you experience in day-to-day -day life. On the extreme other end of the spectrum, you have 100% virtual reality. And so that is, that's like what we see with, um, uh, you know, like Oculus, Meta, uh, and other, you know, headsets on the market. You put the headset on, it's a blindfold, right? You're putting a computer on your head, uh, and you're 100% immersed into a virtual environment. So you have real reality and virtual reality. Everything else in between falls somewhere on that scale. Augmented reality tends to be towards the real end of the spectrum. So mostly real but maybe with some hologram symbology, maybe with some virtual elements. If you get over to the other end, there's a term called augmented virtuality. You don't see that one used quite as much. You can imagine though, it's, it's the inverse. It's mostly virtual, but maybe with some real elements. Imagine, uh, for example, I know in, this is a capability in, maybe an upcoming capability in, in uh, the Quest headsets uh, they've experimented with. If you could put on a virtual reality headset, but then pass in a video feed that shows you where your table is so that you don't run into it <laughs> because that would be important to know, right? So mostly virtual, but with a little bit of real coming in. Everything falls somewhere on that spectrum and every piece of that spectrum has a use case. Now, if we want to talk about it in, in terms of the Navy and, you know, big Navy usage, nav air usage, every piece of that spectrum has an application area. 
Uh, but it's up to us to learn where that is and where to apply, right? So what do you see, like, as, as you're doing this, this uh, you're, you're on the forefront of all this technology, mm -hmm. where do you think it's heading? Well, without going so far as to talking about, you know, brain machine interfaces and all I know, uh, certain people in <laughs> big names in industry are pushing that kind of tech um, without going so far as to speculate on that. Um, I do think that we are, in terms of the Navy, that's what I'll speak to, in terms of uh, Nav Air specifically, uh, this, I'll give you an example. When I was working my thesis work in 2020, uh, there were, at the time, there were no really large um, collaborative efforts among, within the Navy that were organizing all of our extended reality efforts. Uh, so there are no big collaborations. It turns out, through doing my thesis work, and within plus or minus a couple of years right around there, different labs started to bubble up as the technology suddenly within the last few years, driven by the miniaturization of smartphones, certainly, uh, and, and computer chips, has allowed the technology now all of a sudden within the last five-ish, ten years, you can wear it on your head. That capability suddenly has made itself available to us at scale. Right? We can go out and buy one of these headsets at Target now. Um, so almost out of the ether, <laughs> different labs and different groups within labs started popping up, just started bubbling up simultaneously to uh, meet that demand, right? to um, uh, learn what the technology is capable of and figure out where we can apply it. So that was almost, uh, there's some sort of external forcing function that caused that to happen. Um, regardless, it did happen. And so now here we are, we're about five years post that event. And so now we have a uh, you know, somewhat organized effort within Navair to direct all of our efforts, collaborate on projects, et cetera, all towards you know, similar end goals. So nobody, you know, we're not stepping on each other's toes. Uh, we're bringing the right expertise into the right projects at the right time. I think that's the direction that we're going. Back to your question is a more cohesive um, research endeavor leading to a more cohesive end result. So Matt, how do you see this um, technology advancing our everyday lives? So that's a fantastic question. Uh, one of, and not to steer around it, but I will come back to it here in just a second. One of the, I guess one of the advantages uh, that I find in my position is that we frequently have um, industry, uh, commercial companies out in industry, um, very much want to market their products to us. And so we get frequently, maybe several times a year, we get to see up and coming new technology, right? Uh, and where the state of the art is going. So I'll give you one example. Uh, we had a demonstration a little while back with a, with a contact lens that had an augmented reality display built into the size of a contact lens. Um, but I think the continued miniaturization uh, is one aspect, whether it be a contact lens, which I know has now been demonstrated um, in industry, or um, really, I think that's where it goes. I think that's by and large the direction it goes and the continued miniaturization of it to, because the smaller the technology gets, the more seamlessly it can be integrated. No, this is awesome. I, I really appreciate the fact that you came today and shared your story. Absolutely. It's it really, I learned a lot about extended reality, visual reality, it's, it was great. So um, I would just like to invite you all to watch more uh, uh, Naval Horizons videos and thank you for, for tuning in with us today.